And Greta, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nahid. Hello, everybody. Greetings, greetings. Welcome to the ICF Orange County chapter meeting of this month. We've got 18 people so far. We had about 30 registered. So as we start to trickle in, let's just write in chat from where you're calling and whether you're a, whether you're a member of the chapter or a guest. So just put very briefly into the chat and we'll see where, where we're all calling from. So Orange, La Jolla, Cleveland, Ohio. I'm from Warren, Ohio. Yan, yay, small world, Newport Beach, members, guests. Just type in those who are joining. Um, hi, DM, where you're calling in from and hello from your speaker. If you're a member or if you're a guest, hi, Sharon. It's so good to see you all. Yeah, it's wonderful. Hi. Hey, Brenda. Hey, Laura. It's good to see you. I haven't, I've seen you probably in Rossmore, a California. I don't know where that is. Um, San Bernardino, new member. That's right. Rhonda, welcome. Welcome to our new members, our old members, our prospective members, our guests. Yeah. We're up to 20 people. Raphael, hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Well, thanks for doing that. So, we're going to jump right in and get started. I'm very excited about tonight, and I'm going to turn it over to Nahid, who is going to introduce our speaker. And thanks all for being here. So welcome, everybody. Um, I'm so happy that you're here. It's November. So, so Alexia is our grand finale in terms of chapter speakers. Uh, we actually still have another session uh, in December, the last session in our coaching and technology series. So we do have one more in December. But as far as our regular chapter meetings, our next one is going to be our holiday party. So Alexia is our grand finale for November. And we are so lucky to have her. She's nationally accredited speaking coach. And I want to actually jump to na nationally accredited, just nationally known. I'm just going to jump to her bio here. So Alexia Vernon is the author of Step Into Your Moxie. Amplify your voice, visibility, and influence in the world. Branded a Moxie Maven by President Obama's White House Office of Public Engagement for her unique and effective approach to communication and leadership development, Alexia is a sought after speaking coach to fellow coaches, entrepreneurs, corporate leaders, and change makers who want to spread their ideas, positively impact people's lives, grow their businesses, and advance their thought leadership. Alexia is the creator of the Spotlight Speaking Community, and she's supported thousands of speakers through her online training, live events. The Spotlight Speaker Accelerator Coaching Program, her premier mastermind, the Spotlight Speakers Collective. Alexia has also delivered transformational keynotes and experiential corporate training for Fortune 500 companies, CEO forums, college campuses, professional associations, the United Nations, and has contributed to media, including CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS, Forbes.com, Inc.com, the European Business Review, and Women's Health Magazine. Alexia is a LinkedIn Learning Course instructor and lives in Las Vegas, Nevada. She's a former ICF Nevada chapter president and current member of the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce Executive Women's Council and an associate member of the Nevada International Women's Forum. And you can learn even more about Alexia at AlexiaVernon.com. So I need to come back to my group here so I can see you all. So we are super lucky to have Alexia with us today. Um, originally, when she reached out to me, she just happened to have a, a speaking engagement out here. And so she thought she'd just check in with our chapter. And then um, when COVID hit, it turned out that that got canceled. But luckily enough, since we're on Zoom, we get to still have her. So welcome from Las Vegas, Alexia. Really appreciate having you. Thank you very much. Yes, I've had a lot of Los Angeles in my life virtually this week. Uh, <laughs> in the middle of the week, I thought I was going to be spending in your city in person. And I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. There's no, nowhere I feel more comfortable than with a group of fellow coaches. And I was thrilled that I got asked to lead us in an activity because while the presentation itself is all centered around how as coaches we can use our coaching skills front and center in our speaking, that doesn't necessarily provide an opportunity for us to practice getting comfortable with visibility. 
And so if you are not on video, and I'm gonna look at everybody on gallery view for a moment. So we're about 50-50, but I promise you're gonna get so much more out of this evening if you put yourself on video for this next activity. Because to start things off, we are gonna give you an opportunity to lock into owning your expertise. And so in a moment, you're gonna be placed in a Zoom room. And in your room, I'm gonna ask each of you to go around and do a simple activity that has three parts. And part one is you're going to say, good evening, my name is, and then fill in the blank. <laughs> so good evening, my name is Alexia Vernon. You're gonna go right into a second sentence. I'm an expert in, and then you're gonna fill in the blank. I'm an expert in presentation skills for coaches. I'm an expert in health and wellness for stressed out executives, whatever your expertise is. And then the third part is, please ask me questions about. So if I was doing this, please ask me questions about how to get comfortable with visibility, how to be able to create transformational speaking content and how to get booked to speak. Now, here's the rub. And I see, I can see people writing fast and furiously. When it is your turn, my uh, intention with this activity is that you don't hold up notes and cling to them like a baby orangutan might cling to its mother, <laughs> but instead you focus on being present and really being seen by your fellow coaches because that's a theme we're gonna come back to again and again and again. How can we marry being firm in our expertise with being accessible. So to recap, each of you is going to go around and you're gonna say, hello, my name is, fill in the blank. I'm an expert in, fill in the blank. Please ask me questions about, fill in the blank. And I'm gonna encourage you not to talk about it with the other people in your group. So you don't actually have to ask the questions. The goal is for each of you to take about 30 seconds or or so to go around, then we'll bring you back and we're gonna talk about that activity collectively in terms of what came up for you, getting to have the spotlight on you and what you observed from others. And that'll be an entry point into our longer presentation this evening. Everyone ready to go? Fantastic. You guys excited? All right, I'm gonna pause the video and I have resumed recording. So we're back on. Okay, wonderful. For those who are not spending as much time on Zoom as I am, you may not know that at the bottom of your screen, there's a button that says reactions, and then it gives you the option to do a thumbs up or a clap. And sometimes I might say, give me a thumbs up if. You are welcome to use, Lori knows exactly what I'm talking about. You are welcome to use your physical thumb if you're not sure what I'm referring to. But if you see the thumb at the bottom and you wanna click one of those, that's great. Tell me, give me a thumbs up rather, if that activity brought up some sensation in your body when you had to stand and call yourself an expert. Okay, thank you for being honest, the vast majority of the group. Full transparency, when I have to do exercises like that, I still feel a lot of sensation. Second question for you before we talk about this, for how many of you did you feel watching your fellow coaches that you connected with them more when they said, here are the questions you can ask me versus when they said, I'm an expert in, and you can give me a thumbs up. And I'll repeat that. How many of you felt like you connected more when they said, these are the questions you can ask me versus when they said, I'm an expert in. Yeah, put your thumbs down. Fantastic. One of the things we're going to talk about a whole lot tonight is that ironically, one of the number one things that I've seen over the years get coaches, consultants, trainers in their own way of using speaking successfully in terms of growing their business is that we lean too heavily on puffing up and feeling like we have to be the expert who performs rather than focusing on all the brilliant things we do as coaches and figuring out a structure in a way to make that what's front and center. Now, before we dive in, I'd love to hear from, let's say three people, because I'm very cognizant of getting you out back into your lives at a respectable time. 
as you think about your experience in that activity, talk to me and talk to the group about what you discovered about you and your own voice. And you can just pop off of mute and on if you've got something to share. Laura, it looks like you unmuted. What I know about me is that I, I, I feel the need to have a polished intro and I hate it. I hate it every time I'm asked to do it. And I don't like hearing people give polished intros. So I really, and I know that, um, that I'm most effective when I'm real and present though, you know, I still have some voices of, of, of wanting polish and yet knowing it doesn't really serve me. So I, I, you know, it's, it, it, I'm in that, uh, Thank you for your transparency. Hopefully tonight we'll talk about what are the structures that give us the freedom to be who we are, meaning, yeah, yeah. so we're not winging it where it feels like that's awful. I'm so exposed and I'm not coherent and I'm not calling people to take action, but how do we present, prevent ourselves from going to the other side where it feels like we are trying to control every single moment and we're the exact opposite of how we show up as coaches. How do we find that sweet spot between those two poles? Fabulous. How about for others? What was that experience like for you? And what did you discover about your voice and your presence? I felt the same very much what Laura said. I don't like the canned approach. I mean, I've changed it through the years, but it still feels forced. Um, but one of the things that really intrigued me is when uh, someone said in the group, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who said it, but it's like maybe Petra said it. She didn't say, you know, we had to say what we had to be an expert in. And then I wanted to go, and then Laura said like CrossFit puzzle and everything. And I was like, okay, what do people, mm. what are they at? What else do they know? Like, what can I learn about them? So I loved that. That's where I was like, and then the breakout room was done. But I did love that transition of like, oh yeah, what else are you? I'm really good at threading a needle. You know, like whatever it would be, would be interesting. Yes. So you're bringing up something I want everyone to think about as we move through tonight. We often think of our expertise as I'm an expert on executive presence, executive leadership, team coaching, whatever our niche is. But we have so much other expertise that allows people to get to experience us in a deeper way. So I'll share with you some different ways that we can put in the things we're passionate about that let people get to know us as we move through our presentations. I'd love to hear from one final person. And this time it's a slightly different question. What did you observe about your fellow coaches that you want them to know? And I'll say that again. What did you observe as people stepped into visibility that you want them to know and remember and take with them? Uh, Donnelia, and I apologize if I'm saying your name incorrectly, please correct me. <laughs> it's it's Donnelly. Donna Lee. And what I really noticed was that they were game. They were in the game and we actually had fun and creativity and fun are part of what motivates us. And I just, I love that. That was great. Thank you, fellow coaches. Thank you to everybody who showed up and who played full out. Uh, <laughs> I have been, as Nahid shared in my intro, doing this speaking thing for quite a while, but I wanna be super clear that I am not somebody who comes naturally to public speaking. And I still feel a ton of what I call sensation every time I do it, despite speaking hundreds of times every single year. And I share that because oftentimes people will show up to sessions like this feeling like I'm going to listen, but this is for other people who are extroverts, other people who love being the center of attention. And what I want you to know is whether you are that person who loves being in the spotlight, you're that person who loves to be 
um, in the wings or you're somewhere in between, you're in the right place this evening. So about a decade ago, I recognized that I had spent most of my life in an on again, off again relationship with my own voice. <laughs> Meaning that one moment I would feel like I was tap dancing on eggshells, striving to be liked and to give all the right answers and not be called out for failing to be enough of whomever I conjectured other people wanted me to be. But that wasn't the full story because there were other times and frustratingly, sometimes they were in very close proximity to those former times where I actually loved being seen. I loved being able to share my opinion because I was born with pretty strong opinions and I've always had that sense that I have a responsibility to use my voice on behalf of those who may not have had the opportunities that I do. But it took me a really long time to be able to reconcile both those pieces of me and maybe some of you can relate to that. I can trace the beginning of my complicated relationship to my own voice back to grade school, probably third grade, which I think is when so many of us start to have a complicated relationship to our own voices. So in, in my particular case, I was a thumb sucker since as early as I can remember. And so by the time I got to third grade, my mom and my orthodontist at the time were in cahoots <laughs> that they needed to take really aggressive action. And so over the course of a few months, I had what could only be referred to in hindsight as a post-apocalyptic makeover, meaning that first I had a tongue thrust. So my tongue would come forward when I would make lots of consonant sounds. And so I got this device in my upper palate that had these spikes that would cut my tongue and train it to stay in the back of my mouth. In addition from all the thumb sucking, I had a really shallow palate. And so I had another device in my mouth that had a spot for a key at the roof of my mouth. And I'd have to turn that key a couple of times a day to bring my jaw back into alignment. And I can see some of your faces. So I don't know if you're disgusted imagining it or if you've had to go through it, but we are truly just getting started. In addition, uh, I had braces because I don't think too many kiddos wind up at an orthodontist without getting braces. And I thought it would be really cool to match the rubber bands on my braces with my glasses. And so I was rocking a lot of turquoise in this region for a number of years. And last, but most certainly not least, I had headgear, that burlap looking sack that would sit on the top of your head and attach to the rest of my metal accoutrement. And so to recap, tongue thrust corrector, jaw realigner, braces, glasses, headgear. Around this time, I had to give my first current events presentation. And although this happened many decades ago, I can still feel in my chest the feeling I felt then of getting up in front of the room, looking out at my classmates' faces, opening my mouth to speak, and literally having nothing come out. And feeling that sense of like a colony of butterflies flapping their wings in my chest, getting sweaty, trying to swallow to get some lubrication in my throat, but feeling that horrible sense of cotton mouth. This went on, it felt like years. It was probably more like a minute or two. And as my classmates started to laugh and I started to cry, I made a pact that if I could just get some words out, I would never put myself in a position where I felt so diminished again. And I'm not proud to say that I made good on that promise for quite a while, meaning that while I was always driven and ambitious, I would look for opportunities to write my way to success. Or if I did have to present my ideas to have done so much research and to feel like the curator of research rather than ever expressing how I genuinely felt, particularly if it disrupted the status quo. Now I'm sharing this story with you because what I know from doing this work for a long time is that most of us are carrying around a story about our communication, our public speaking, that's based on one, maybe two moments from our history. 
And that in those moments where we think about going after visibility opportunities, or we do go back into visibility opportunities, we go right back into that story. That story for me that said, I'm not smart enough. I'm not uh, funny enough. I'm not comfortable enough. I'm not something fill in the blank enough. And so I want to ask you to think about what's the story that you've been carrying around about who you are as a speaker and as a thought leader. So not as a coach, but specifically, what's the story around who you are as a speaker and thought leader? And whether those stories you tend to replay are true, and mine, unfortunately, is 100% true, whether the story you're carrying around is not so true or more likely than not somewhere in between those two poles, how is that story serving you to show up, to speak up, to be the thought leader that your clients need you to be? Because if what you're recognizing is that story that maybe nobody else knows about, but that is filtering into my self-talk, that's impacting the choices I do make in terms of visibility or perhaps it's keeping me paralyzed. If that story is not serving your fullest expression of being a coaching thought leader, then I'm gonna ask you to start to rewrite it. And I'd love to be your partner in that throughout the course of the evening, because what I know is that as we start to look at strategies and techniques to do the work of speaking more professionally so that speaking really can be something that aligns with our business goals, that if everything up here is a little wonky, none of what I share with you the rest of this evening is going to make the impact that I know it can. I love seeing so many of you taking notes because I'm gonna give you things tonight and I encourage you, if you've got your digital guide that got sent out, you can uh, type directly into that digital guide or write into it if you printed it. But if you didn't, Nahid's gonna send it out afterward and feel free to take notes so that you're able to come back to the things that are most meaningful for you. I want you to think about how I opened with a story tonight because it's something we're going to deconstruct in a little bit. My hope for you is that as we go through, you're able to keep two hats on. One, the hat of a participant and just feeling into the experience. But number two, I want you to have that coach's hat on and to stay curious, to look at what did I do so that at those points where we demystify that, you're getting the learning in terms of, oh, this is how I want to tell stories, or this is how I want to structure my big idea. Or as we move into the final piece, this is how I want to make sure I'm messaging when I'm pitching myself for visibility opportunities. So I will at times be sharing my screen to show you slides, but then like I am right now, I'm also going to come off at various points so we can speak with each other. There will also be more formal time at the end for Q&A. So I'll do my best to keep my eye on the Q&A and if there's something I can address in real time, I will. But if I don't get to it in real time, please know that I will come back for you at the end. All righty. So one of the biggest things that I see holding really wise, very experienced coaches back is their own fear around visibility. And I'm not a big fan of the word fear. And here's why. When we're doing something where our life is endangered, I live in the, uh, I don't live in the Pacific Northwest anymore. I live in the Southwest. I live in Las Vegas. And so there are times if I'm in my backyard, I have to be careful that I might step onto a scorpion. And if I see one and I'm barefoot, that's a legitimate use of the word fear because <laughs> you don't want to step on one of those suckers. However, more often than not, when we use the fear to describe what's going on inside of us, when we're on the cusp of going into a visibility opportunity, when we're on the cusp of doing something big or saying something big, this is an inaccurate statement and it only breeds more discomfort and often paralysis. If our clients came to us and they had a big juicy opportunity and they were feeling a lot, more likely than not, we would ask them some questions. We would get curious. What do you think that feeling is there to teach you? How might that be an indication that you are actually playing to your edge and you're in the zone? 
And so while tonight the focus is not specifically on us getting comfortable with visibility, if you're starting to feel, and I call it that butterfly flapping sensation, because that's what it's like for me. But for others, it may be that you feel like you're heating up, like there is a hot oven in your armpits. For others, it may feel like there's a churning in your gut. For others, it could feel like your legs are ice blocks. They're just frozen and stuck in place. But anytime you feel that, and to be sure, even if you've been coaching, even if you've been speaking for 10 plus years, it might come up for you at some point as we're talking about structure. For others, you might be like getting on stage or getting on Zoom, easy peasy. But when we get to the parts on pitching, that might be when it arises. But the reason why I want us to make a commitment to shifting from calling it fear to sensation is sensation is much more objective. It's real. We can express gratitude when we're feeling sensation because it means we're in the game. It means that we're doing something that matters. And if you think about many of the most beautiful conversations you've had with clients, I bet you felt some sensation there. But because you got to the beautiful conversation, you probably also didn't use it as an excuse to play small or to circle around the perimeter of what you wanted to say. You used it as an invitation for candid communication, for great questions. And that's what I'm asking of you as we talk about content this evening. When I first hung out my shingle as a coach, it was back in 2007. And at the time, I had no clue what I was doing. Maybe some of you can relate to this. I was pivoting my niche. It felt like every 30 seconds. So I had come from the nonprofit social justice sector. So at first I thought I would coach nonprofit professionals who like me had gotten to a certain place in leadership, but then might be feeling like they weren't exactly sure where to go next. But I would also get opportunities because I was a really young new coach to speak to organizations about the multiple generations in the workplace. And sometimes I would be asked to talk about gender equity or diversity. The result of that may, meant that um, when I was thinking about the presentations I wanted to give, I did a lot of things that were wonky. So one of them was that I wasn't clear on what my business goals were, so I wasn't clear on what my speaking goals were. One of the best things you can do if you're thinking about wanting to use virtual speaking engagements or eventually live speaking engagements when we start to move back into that arena is to get really clear what is your primary business goal, meaning are you looking for private clients? Are you looking for organizational clients? and to make sure that you have that level of certainty and that you pick one primary goal so that you can have one signature speech that advances that goal that you can feel really comfortable with and deliver again and again and again. And that's what we're gonna talk about this evening, how to start to create that signature speech. But another mistake I made <laughs> was that I didn't do that for a lot of years. I was pivoting and recreating my content all the time, which meant, I never felt comfortable with my content because I never had real command over it, but it also made it really hard to pitch because I would pitch, I've got five different presentations I can give, which are you interested in? And people didn't know how to think of me. Plus, oftentimes I would get booked to present a presentation that I, I was pretty decent at but it didn't align with where my coaching practice was going. So then there was a real issue because if I'm talking about onboarding in the workplace, but I wanna be a public speaking coach, that was not the right connection for people to decide to work with me further. I also was really puffing up and posturing in the expert space rather than allowing my presentations to show my coaching mastery. We went through that first exercise this evening where you got to do a little bit of both, meaning initially you got to say, I'm an expert in, but then you got to shift and think about the other people who are watching you and their needs. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about tonight. How do we craft presentations that speak to the head and the hearts of the people who are in our audience and give them as much as possible an experience of who we would be if they coached with us, since that's what they need to make that decision. Another mistake I made, especially online, was presenting webinars rather than transformational presentations. 
Now, I don't want to say that webinars don't have their place, but if you're anything like me or a lot of the clients that I work with, you are not running huge courses that put hundreds and thousands of people through a do-it-yourself system. Whether you're working in organizations, whether you're working with individuals one-on-one -on -one, or you're running groups for individuals, retreats, um, VIP days, my hunch is that because you're a coach, most of the programs you're running are not only about your content that's prepackaged, it's about the experience that you create with people. And so the structure I'm gonna give you this evening is going to help you look at, okay, how do I give a presentation that still showcases my coaching front and center, that lets me tell stories, that lets me ask really good questions, that lets me show my presence, that demonstrates I'm really listening to what people are saying rather than only hiding out behind slides throughout the entire presentation. And then another mistake I made, and we're gonna talk about this one a lot, was I failed to call audiences to actually take action. So I would do one of two things, and maybe some of you have done this before. I would often mismanage time, and so I would run out of time, and then I would conveniently just skip my offer any way people could stay in touch with me. But on the other side of the spectrum, I was in enough presentations where people would give me this structure for how to pitch. So sometimes I would do these 10 minute pitches and feel like I was nauseated and had to take a shower afterward because they were just so gross. We're gonna talk tonight about how do you create an offer at the end that is simple and short and allows people who are interested to stay connected with you but doesn't make them feel like they have to make a decision to take out a second loan on their house within the next 30 minutes in order to stay in touch with you. So I want to share some of the places where people who I've worked with have had an opportunity to speak. And here's why. Oftentimes when I talk to coaches, there are two kinds of thinking. One, if I'm going to do speaking, I need to be a professional keynote speaker. That's going to require me to get a speaking agent and to travel all of the time. But then on the other side of the spectrum, I hear a lot of people thinking, uh, if I'm going to do this, it's only going to be presentations where I speak for free. And then in order to make this work, I have to make sure that tons of people are signing up to work with me afterward. And then that's pushing me back into that growth zone where I have to monetize on the back end. And I'm sharing this because, you know, I've worked with, I don't know, maybe several thousand coaches through individual and group programs over the years. And most of them are doing a combination of both. So some are speaking at professional associations and universities and being paid as a traditional keynote speaker. But many of them have also gotten really clear who are the clients that they adore working with and what are the kinds of virtual and in-person events where those people will be so that I can show up and I don't have to sell hard because my ideal leader, my ideal entrepreneur, my ideal parent, whoever your avatar is, is already there. So if I show up and give them a coaching experience through my presentation, that's gonna do a lot of the work for me. The number one shift that I made that started to change everything in terms of truly seeing virtual and also in-person speaking be a consistent, predictable generator of business for me was remembering that all the stuff that I was agonizing over was about me. <laughs> and that was a problem because as a coach, of course, we're agenda -less. Everything is 100% about our client, but yet I wasn't able to do that with my speaking. I invite you as we go through this evening to 100% center your thinking about the audience, the kinds of audiences where you're wanting to create transformation. Because when we are 100% focused on the audience we are serving, there is no room for self-doubt to get us in our own way. When we see visibility as about our ego rather than about transformation, that's where we get stuck. And that's, if I could create a revolution in how coaches think about visibility, that's where it would start. Recognizing that if you know that your ideas can positively, perhaps radically improve people's 
lives, businesses, careers, health, visibility and speaking, it's not just an opportunity. It's a responsibility. It's a responsibility because while we can't work with every single person who needs us, if we can bring coaching and transformation to more people through presentations and we shirk that, that's us not living into the legacy that we as coaches were put here for. That's what I believe. And so let's look at what are the key ingredients of what I call a soul stirring presentation. And these are very similar things that will go into pitches, but we'll get to pitches a little bit later. And we're gonna unpick this a whole, whole, whole heck of a lot. So at the center of every effective presentation is an idea worth spreading, meaning one clear idea with a distinct viewpoint that we're going to call people to take action on. And so many of you have probably seen TED Talks and many of you, because you're coaches, <laughs> have probably seen and heard from Brene Brown a lot. So I'm gonna use her as an example here for a moment. If we think about Brene Brown's very first TEDx talk on the power of vulnerability, that whole talk could be summed up in one idea worth spreading, which is TED's verbiage, the, the TED association. But that idea worth spreading that if we want to live a wholehearted life, vulnerability is our pathway there. We're going to work on your ideas worth spreading in a moment, but that's first and foremost, we need to know what that big idea is so that we can have a presentation that's going to call people to take action. Second, we need a persuasive organizational structure. And while there's several of them that can work effectively, I'm gonna share with you my favorite that I've seen work for pretty much every single coach in every niche so that you can start to play with your information tonight. We also need a call to action that has two parts and we're gonna cover exactly what that looks like. And we have to make sure that our coaching skills are front and center. So we're not speaking at people in a way that we never would one-on-one -on -one with people, um, but that we're speaking with people and that we're layering in provocative stories, interesting questions, direct feedback throughout. Because if we are doing presentations the way that I'm recommending we do, it's going to showcase our coaching competencies. We are going to create intimacy and trust, demonstrate coaching presence, create awareness for our audience members, be able to ask those powerful questions, and also give some tough love when necessary and use direct communication. So what I wanna give you next are some ways to start to settle into your big idea. Now, if you've been speaking for a long time, you may know exactly what this is, but I'm gonna encourage you nonetheless to stay curious because oftentimes what people will tell me is, oh yeah, I know what my presentation is. But then when we go through this and there's some spiral learning, oftentimes one of two things can happen. One, people realize that they don't really have an idea worth spreading. They just have an idea that everyone's heard that they're passionate about. And that's a really important distinction because an idea worth spreading means it's something that the whole world hasn't heard yet. And they want to spread that idea. And I'm gonna give you some ways to be able to think about this. So do not worry if it feels like every single idea has already been taken. Oftentimes it's about layering your viewpoint into that idea. Other times people will say, well, isn't the core idea that I'm a public speaking coach or I'm a health coach or I'm a financial coach. And that's not an idea. That's our profession. And if we're thinking about our presentations, just about sharing information like a teacher, that's not an idea worth spreading either. So I'm not expecting anyone to know exactly what their idea will be tonight, but I do encourage you to think about the questions that I share with you so that you can go back to them. Question number one, what is often left out of conversations? So when I started to ask myself this question as I was making the transition from being the coach of everything but the master of nothing, I realized that one of the things that was often left out of conversations that I was passionate about was how do we get comfortable with visibility? So what I did not share with you is that by the time I was 19, I was on the speaking circuit and it had happened completely accidentally after I won the Miss Junior America competition. But things were definitely not rainbows and cupcakes in terms of my presentations for a long time because I hadn't learned how to navigate that discomfort in my body when I felt it. 
for you, you might realize what is often left out of conversation. So maybe you are in the health and wellness space and you recognize everybody's talking about uh, getting rid of sugar cravings or getting rid of gluten or having a paleo diet. But for you, what's often left out is the role of self-worth. So asking this question, you might realize, hmm, my one sentence is the true pathway to curing cravings is unshakable self-worth. I'm going to give you some more questions here. Question number two, what is the source of your audience's problem? And it's the, it's, so your audience probably has a lot of problems, but more specifically, the problem that you solve as a coach. So it might be that other people are talking about the symptom, but what's at the source that might be a beautiful idea worth spreading for you? What irks you about your industry? So sometimes that can make for a provocative idea worth spreading. I have a client who is a licensed psychologist and family empowerment coach. And one of the things that really bothered her was that no one was talking about the fact that she saw in most of her clients that there was no inherent dysfunction in families that she was seeing, but there was a whole lot of stable misery. People were fine. And so when she sat with this question, what irks you about your industry, that illuminated for her, her idea of worth spreading that too many families are struggling from an epidemic of stable misery. And that became the center of her signature speech. Another one of my favorites, what is the breakthrough audience members need to have to work with you? So if we're looking at creating presentations that create aha moments, like our coaching sessions do, you want to think about what is the number one aha moment or breakthrough you hope your audience members will have that will get them excited at the prospect of working with you further. And so in a moment, I'm going to ask for a couple volunteers who are noodling on some of these questions, because what I've witnessed over the years is that sometimes hot seating one or two people, light bulbs start to go off for everybody else in terms of, oh, this is how I can work my way into my idea worth spreading. So I wanted to share with you one of my idea worth spreadings from the keynote that I give when I'm speaking to corporate audiences. So you know me tonight where I'm talking about presentation skills for coaches and how to create a signature presentation. But when I'm paid to speak to organizations as a keynote speaker, usually it's around the subject of women's leadership development because that's a lot of the work I do in companies. So when I'm speaking to corporate leaders, whether it's C-suite leaders or HR leaders, my idea we're spreading is around female leadership pipelines. So for organizations to create a female leadership pipeline, it's time to re-envision their approach to women's leadership development and corporate gender responsibility. And so before I sort of look at with you how I would develop that and structure it, I would love to give you a moment or so to think about, hmm, Maybe I know exactly what my idea worth spreading is. More likely than not, I might be uh, spinning, like I'm close, I'm in, the, I'm in the right sandbox, but I don't quite have it yet. So I'm gonna stay quiet, and then in about 30 seconds or so, I'm gonna ask for a volunteer or two to come on video so we can talk it through before the group. So right now, I'm gonna encourage you to think about uh, can you think about one sentence that would be at the center of a signature talk that if you gave it again and again and again would likely be a vehicle to be able to take audience members who resonate with you and create the opportunity for them to work with you further? So I saw Jan, um, and you can correct me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, say I'm volunteering, which I love, but we'll give folks another minute before we do that. So wherever you are in your own musing, I'm going to encourage you to pause and let's do some hot seats. Yawn.
And again, please, please let me know your pronunciation of your name. It's Yen. Yen. Okay. Thank you. So tell me what you're noodling on and how I can help. Um, I just finished writing a book. It's called Leadership Unlocked, The Power of Your Body mm. for Impact and Fulfillment. And I'm noodling on making a, creating a signature uh, presentation around that. Do you have some thoughts about what the sentence will be? The questions you listed that intrigued me was the first one. What's often left out of conversations? In the corporate world, we, th we think about, you know, um, conceptual ideas a lot. We think about emotional intelligence more so in the last 25, 30 years. But we really rarely think about the body. I think that's what's left out of the conversation. Um, one sentence. The secret power to your leadership effect effectiveness without working harder. So I feel like you're, you're, you're starting with the title, which is a great way in. Now your title could certainly be the name of your book. Oftentimes when we have a book, we'll use that same title, but it doesn't have to be. So as I'm listening, I feel like you said something and this is gonna be my language, not exactly yours, but there's something very disruptive about what you're saying that I love. So your body is the pathway to your most effective leadership. Mm -hmm. Whether you use that as a title or not, to me, that's probably your central idea of this presentation. That's the big idea, because I agree with you 100%. There are no shortage of people who are saying emotional intelligence is important. And please, if your subject is emotional intelligence, do not feel like you can't find an idea worth spreading. You absolutely can. But I love this idea of having one that's really clear. Your pathway to your best leadership or your pathway to your authentic leadership is your body. I like that. And then in a moment, as we start to outline, see what happens if you play with something in that arena. And I think you'll be very happy structure wise. Great. Is there somebody else who may perhaps not have quite as much clarity and that's okay, um, but feels like he, she, they would benefit from a quick conversation around the idea? And to remember, oh, fantastic, Gideon. So, um, even though I'm not really clear in my audience, my, my thought is that burnout is the single biggest threat to the American. So, you're breaking up for me. Sorry about uh, that. I heard burnout is the single biggest threat. And so I'm with you. And I think that absolutely could be your big idea. I just don't know what it's the threat to. <laughs> well, I mean, I have my own opinions. I don't know what you said it's the biggest threat to. The American health care system, care system today. That is a powerful idea worth spreading. No edit needed. So I want to move us along to structure because you all are rocking the idea worth spreading, but you'll notice from both of your fellow members who volunteered, there's a strong point of view. They're not necessarily ideas that everyone's going to agree with. And that's what makes them special. That's what makes you that person who needs to carry that idea as a coach. The next piece is, are we able to create a compelling presentation around that idea that moves people to take action? And when I say move people to take action, I don't just mean hire us. I mean, really take action on that idea and create change for themselves and create change for others. So as we talk about outlines, I'm gonna come back to, it was already your turn, so we're gonna move ahead. <laughs> My favorite organizational structure, which is called problem, cause, solution. And it begins with you telling a story and facilitating an aha at the end of it. So remember I mentioned at the beginning, I was gonna tell you, or I told you a story and we were gonna come back to it. When I do a signature presentation that's around public speaking, I will often start with that headgear story. Does anyone remember what did I do at the end of that story before I moved into the rest of my presentation? What did I do at the end of it? And I'm actually gonna stop sharing so that it's easier for me to see you all. 
you connect it to the audience. You said all of us carry a story that only really because of one or two moments in history. And then right after that, so brilliant, you spotted, I connected it to you. So I turned my story over from myself to my audience. And then what specifically did I do after? You did I us. tell you what to do? Yes. I asked you questions. And so, okay, let me go back. This is where I wish I had faster fingers. Uh, <laughs> We want as coaches to open with a story that allows us to create credibility, not because we're hustling for approval and we're saying, I'm the greatest coach ever and I won 500 awards. Whoever introduces you, they can do all that. <laughs> but when we start, what we wanna do as much as possible is take ourselves off a pedestal and tell a story where we're a little vulnerable, where we make it safe for other people to be vulnerable in the room with us and to make sure that we're ending that story by asking questions that demonstrate our skills as a coach, but that hopefully can create that aha moment for our audience members. Then we wanna use that as a bridge to moving into the problem that the people in our audience have. So a problem doesn't have to be something that's keeping people up at night, but it's keeping people from their potential and it's a problem they recognize they have. We don't wanna be convincing people that they have problems they don't because they're not gonna buy in. So this evening, for example, the problem is you wanna use speaking and visibility to be able to grow your audience, to grow your business. Most people have an understanding that we have to do that in our presentations, but the step that often gets left out is this next one, cause. If we can get people to agree with the cause of the problem, then they're much more likely to move along to the solution. So let me give you an example. If let's say we were talking about homelessness and the problem is there's too many people in our society who are homeless, most of us would jump right to the solution. But if we did that, the solution probably would sound like we'll give people who are homeless food. But if we go to the cause, it's gonna sound a whole lot different. So problem, too many people in our society are homeless cause, well, this is where our viewpoint comes in. Cause might be because there's an equity in education, because there's systemic racism, because there's not enough high paying, or there's not enough, there's not a living wage for people who don't have access to high paying jobs. We want to talk about the cause so that people are more inclined, if we can get agreement there, to see the solution or the pathway forward. So that when we move into the solution, we're not telling somebody every single thing we're going to address in our coaching with them, because that's going to create overwhelm and force us right back into that expert place we don't want to be in. But we want to think about that solution being, what are the top one, two, three things somebody needs to know to take action on the idea we've presented and that they can do successfully on their own? And then if they're interested, when we move into the conclusion slash call to action, we'll explain how they continue to work with us, how they can continue to hear from us if they're interested. So let me show you a whole um, presentation. So to go back to the women's leadership pipeline presentation that I give, I will open with a story about a keynote I gave. And you know, to fast forward to the end of the story, I asked questions about what would it look like for you if in your organization, you were able to create a pathway for high potential women to be 100% themselves and have that set them up for leadership. So that's my question that gets asked at the end. Then I move into my problem. You're all here today because you don't have a robust female leadership pipeline for your leaders. So that's not something that the people in the audience disagree with. People nod their heads. Again, your problem is something that everybody agrees they have. That's why they showed up to listen, whether it's a virtual presentation or whether it's a live presentation uh, or in-person presentation. The cause is where you get to put in your secret sauce. The cause is your approach. So with Yen, the cause is we haven't learned how to access our bodies. Problem might be, um, we have a leadership problem. Obviously I'm simplifying this significantly cause our bodies aren't in the process. Solution then would be, this is how we develop our bodies. Um, for Gideon, problem might be burnout. We all agree that's why we're here. Cause, 
that's where you get to share your secret sauce in terms of what's leading to the burnout. And if we can agree with you on the cause, we're going to follow the trajectory of what you think when you present the solution. So in this case, this is where I get into the IP that's in my book. So women are going bunny or dragon, two different leadership archetypes I talk about, and their unique needs are not being met in traditional diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. And as a result, they're getting stuck in leaving. I know that if people in my audience nod their heads by the end of this, they're much more likely to follow the solution that I recommend, which is if we want to create a female leadership pipeline, we've got to create opportunities for rehearsal and role play and take on corporate gender responsibility. Now, I'm not trying to make you all experts in women's leadership development. I just want to model the structure. And then when I get to my call to action, there's two parts. There's evidence. So I'm encouraging them to take these things and use it within their organizations. And then I'm sharing that if they recognize that they don't have the resources that are necessary to be able to do this, I can be a strategic partner in their organizations. So I want to move to the next piece because this is where the butterflies start to flap for a lot of people, even if they've been coaching and in sales, and even if they've been speaking for a while. How do I do this in a way that's classy and it's converting? And so your call to action does have two parts. Number one, what do you want your audience to do next? Do you want them to shift their thinking? Shift, to be clear. Do you want them to shift their thinking? Do you want them to create a new set of habits? Do you want them to implement a system that you've shared with them? Do you want them to vote a different way? but you've got to get really clear to make sure that the presentation builds toward that call to action for how will they carry forward what you gave them. But then there's that second critical piece, which is about us. When we make clear what it is we want for them, we also need to show the gap. So if I was doing this in my female leadership pipeline, I might say one of the struggles that a lot of organizations have is they have really sound diversity and equity and inclusion programs that are tackling race. But those same people are not masterful in the gender conversation. And I get that because most of us don't, ex don't have mastery in a lot of different areas. And so I've been doing this work for a while. And if you'd like to have a partner in this process, then let's have a conversation. And so I want to share with you for coaches what I've seen through the years, the two most effective ways to be able to elegantly bring in offers to your presentations and have event organizers give you raving reviews and not be upset, you know, that you've done something that um, has offended their audience. And so the first is a postcard. So if we were in person at the end of a presentation, I might give you a postcard that on the front has a strong brand photo of me and a reminder of what my core message is, using speaking to grow your business and your impact. It'd be great if I could show you the back. Here we go. And then on the back, it's a simple, let's continue the conversation. It lets people select for themselves. Yes, I'm interested in public speaking tips. Yes, I'm interested in group speaker coaching or individual coaching. Yes, I'd like a free digital guide. Yes, I'd like to book you for a presentation. And if you're speaking to an aligned audience, and we're going to talk about how to make sure you do that a little bit later on, in general, somewhere between 25 to 50% of the room should be filling this out. Now, that does not mean that whole room, all those 25 to 50% of people will necessarily become clients. But at the very least, they should probably want to stay in touch with you. If they don't, it's a good indication that one of two things is happening. One, the offer isn't connecting, meaning what you're presenting might be interesting, but it hasn't really specifically addressed people's pain points and personal motivators. So it was meh which doesn't mean you're meh. <laughs> it means that the content wasn't the right content. It didn't feel relevant and timely for people. Or the other option is that people don't understand that gap. In other words, they feel like they've got everything they need and they're not clear why they need to stay in touch. These kinds of postcards work really well when you're speaking to groups that are under 50 people. And obviously when you're speaking face-to-face. But as we know at this moment, the majority of presentations are happening online. 
Uh, I recently did a Google search for virtual presentations and 8 million returns came back, which to me is an exciting thing because there have never been more opportunities for coaches, for consultants, for trainers, for experts to be able to book speaking gigs quickly. And I'd be curious, and he can share this in a little bit, when things start to move back face to face and more event organizers I'm hearing are thinking probably fall 2021, I don't hear a lot of them saying everything will go back face to face. We'll still keep some face to face because we can safely once we get to that place, but we're going to keep doing some things virtual because it's allowed us to expand our membership. And so that's a great thing for people like us, because if you want to stay fully focused on virtual presentations, you can, if like a lot of coaches, myself included, you really enjoy that rush of being in the room with people, you'll be able to do that too. But let's look at something that works when you have larger face-to-face -face groups, over 50 people, but that also works if you're online and you obviously can't give people a postcard. And so I'm gonna share with you another one of my real offers. So when I'm presenting to groups, oftentimes I will be having a live virtual workshop that's coming up after the fact. And so this is a real um, opportunity. So if anyone's interested, you can go to book your first speaking gig and sign up. But the goal here, and this is where a lot of us get it wrong, is that what we're sending people to, if it's a digital guide, or in this case, a virtual workshop, needs to pick up where your presentation ends and not feel redundant. And let me say that again. What's critical is that you're offering people a way to stay in touch with you that's not redundant to what you've already shared. And that's the biggest mistake I see here. And instead, it should be something that picks up where your presentation ended and delivers more value. So one of the reasons why I do this particular virtual workshop once a year on how to create, and I try to make it a little cheeky, an amazeball speaking pitch, is if in this presentation for coaches, we're talking primarily about how to bring your coaching skill set into the presentation itself. And we do touch on pitching a little bit. I'm able to, with folks in 60 minutes, spend more time talking about the differences between a speaking submission and a speaking pitch. I'm able to talk more about how to make yourself irresistibly attractive to event organizers. And I'm able to talk more about negotiating speaking fees, writing content, how to research for speaking gigs. When we do something like this on a virtual presentation, we want to do two things. Number one, as I mentioned, make sure it picks up where that presentation ended. But the second, that it's a really easy email, uh, very easy web address for people to be able to enter because they're on a virtual workshop with us. So some might take a picture, others might open a new screen, but oftentimes I'll see clients have something like alexiavernon.com forward slash uh, amazeballs hyphen pitch hyphen seven hyphen December. And you know, people don't remember that. So this is really easy. You don't have to have a separate domain, but you can go into your, wherever you buy websites, buy a simple domain and just have it forward to a page that's embedded on your website. And so I want to, there we go, um, come back for a moment and just check in because if I had to pick one area where people get the most stuck in terms of ensuring that their presentations translate from people who are nodding their heads and interested to staying in touch with them, it's this offer piece. And so while I've got more stuff for you, I just wanna check if you've got any questions that would be helpful for me to address at this point on that. Everyone have some ideas for if you were speaking, the kinds of things you might wanna send people to in your presentation. I'm not sure with the yes, is the yes you're clear or is the yes you've got some ideas for what you would use? I'm clear, perfect. Uh, no ideas, I feel, okay, I feel stuck because I feel like I need to have the offering first before I reach out for presentation opportunities. So let me talk about that. You do want to know ultimately what is the ideal business outcome from this? So it doesn't mean that you have to think to yourself, by the end of my presentation, I hope an organization is going to book me on retainer for $25,000 a year, and that's a successful presentation. But 
you would want to know, let's say, all right, my ideal outcome, if I'm working with companies is retainer clients. And so in order for them to think that I'm a good coach for them, this is the presentation I need to give. These are the questions I need to answer. And this is the thing that I should give them after, whether that's a cheat sheet, whether that's a free virtual workshop, whether that's a conversation, because that's going to allow you to reverse engineer everything. Make sure you have the right idea. Make sure you have the right problem. Make sure that you have the right solution that gives enough that people can implement it, but still makes it possible for you to create that gap and show why they would want to stay connected. And please feel free, you can jump in right here before we, we dive back in. I want you to get the answers you need to take action on this. I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to jump in and say I'm fascinated and taking notes and getting tons of ideas in my head. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Um, and this is one of those things I'm going to give you um, a way to stay connected later, but I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> so if you're on LinkedIn, I have lots of people who will often say, okay, a day later, I suddenly had an idea for this could be my offer. Or this could be my title. And so if you like me are um, a noodler, know that this is not a one shot opportunity. You are welcome to email me or reach out if you've got an idea that percolates and you want my two cents. Well, it's more than two cents normally, but you know, like my feedback on it. So I'm going to pop us back in. Okie dokie. So here's another place where coaches get stuck. So I mentioned one of them is often in that call to action. They might have beautiful presentations and they might be doing a great job showing their skills. But again, Presentations don't translate in terms of people staying in touch because there's no simple way for people to take action that's relatively low stakes, like joining your newsletter list, grabbing a digital guide, signing up for a call and so forth. But the other big area is that in the presentations themselves, they're not speaking to the conversation in the head. And let me explain by what I mean by that. We sh I shared with you the structure that that problem cause solution that works really well for most coaches in their presentations. But now it's important that the fiber of your presentation allows you to have direct communication, allows you to tell stories that don't position you as an untouchable expert, but show your humanity without diminishing your credibility. You want to make sure that as you're moving through every piece of your presentation, you're asking questions. Again, even when we're online, we don't want it to be webinars where we're hidden behind slides. We want to be able to ask questions, both those rhetorical questions that people might be answering in their heads, but also making sure that we're spending time with people, giving them opportunities to ask questions. But then the next thing I want to talk about is making sure that we address those pain points and personal motivators. So most pain points that coaches are going to encounter show up as objections. And if in our presentations, we can address those, we're going to be much more successful, not only in getting people to take action in our presentations, but ultimately with us. So we know the most common ones. I don't have enough money. This is going to cost too much. It's going to take too much time. It's going to be hard. This isn't relevant. But sometimes we talk about those, but we forget to mention the personal motivators. And what we know is that one of the number one reasons people decide to work with coaches is because we want a stronger sense of self, a stronger sense of self in terms of how we show up in our leadership, a stronger sense of self in terms of our ability to use our own voices, a stronger sense of self in terms of our relationships with our children. And so in our presentations, irrespective of the content, we don't just want to talk about the struggle. We also want to talk about the possibility. I'm going to give you some language for how you can do that in a moment, but I'd love for you to think about what are the things that your audiences are desiring for themselves? Maybe it's more money. Maybe it's more time. Maybe it's more freedom. Maybe it's more creativity. And without promising something that you're not delivering on, how can you make sure that as you move through that problem cause solution, you're making it very clear 
how the content you're sharing allows them to live into the legacy that they want for themselves. And so you know a lot of these phrases, and I can say you know because it's what you use with clients. That yet my hunch is that whether you're speaking online, in podcasts, writing articles, or giving speeches, you may not always be integrating these kinds of phrases into your presentation. And some of these you've heard me use this evening. Phrases like, if you're anything like me, you dot, dot, dot. I have a hunch that blank is really important to you. I have a hunch that being um, a role model to your employees or being a role model to your children is really important to you. And I get that. Phrases like, I suspect you are sick and tired of, I suspect you are sick and tired of marketing that feels gross. I suspect you're sick and tired of formulas that don't feel authentic. Imagine if, imagine if you had a way to be able to get comfortable with visibility, to create a signature speech and to get booked, to regu booked regularly to speak. How would that help you grow a business that you're really proud of? So integrating these kinds of sentences throughout your presentation, as well as doing it via questions. So some of my favorite questions to integrate into presentations, what is it that you really want? What are you ready to let go of once and for all? How can you reclaim the role of protagonist in this story? What lies on the other side of your fear? And so I'm coming back again for a moment. And this time I'm gonna encourage you to use the chat. I would love for you to think about some of the things you love to say with clients, individuals, or with groups that you maybe have never thought about putting into a presentation that feel quintessentially you. And if you would put those in the chat, just start to name what is some of that messaging that should be front and center for you in your presentations. And remember that when you share, not only do you give other people permission to do the same, but you might help them have light bulbs go off as well. And so I'm going to respond in the meantime to a question that I saw come up. The call to action changes depending on what it is, a new course or an engagement, and that we need to stick to one thing. So this is a fantastic question. So the answer is the same type of thing that comes at the, should come at the end, meaning you're wanting one signature speech. But I'm going to just give you me as an example because it's easier to answer on the fly. I may not always have that same virtual workshop coming up but I'm always going to have something around pitching that happens at the end because that's the next logical step. Where things get dangerous is, let's say at the end of this presentation you're experiencing, sometimes I'm sharing that I've got um, a workshop on sales conversations or I've got a workshop on writing copy. Those things are related but this presentation doesn't land at that final destination. And so that's why oftentimes your signature presentation isn't going to be come give me money and join this program because that's something that might only happen occasionally. But you can have a digital guide, a quiz, an audio recording, something that's evergreen that brings people into the fold. And then when you open enrollment for things, they're ready and waiting for you. I hope that helps. And I love seeing some of this language that's coming in. Um, I'm sure most of you can read it. If you did know what to do, what would that be? Oh, I get the, the goosies. The inner journey is the journey to true success. How did that make you feel? Yep. What is preventing you from whatever your thing is? Uh, if you had a magic wand, what would you change right now? So I love, I love um, all of these. And I want you to start thinking about these phrases as your secret sauce. So we spent quite a bit of time talking about how to speak with an audience rather than at an audience. And as we now transition into talking about, so how do we win speaking engagements and how do we talk to event organizers? The exact same principles we've been talking about in terms of your content, they apply in the pitching. 
And this is another one of those areas where so often it's like, we forget that all the things that make us good coaches make us good presenters. And all the things that make us good coaches don't only make us good presenters, but can also make us good marketers. So being able to speak to that conversation in the head, again, it's how you show up as a coach throughout your presentation, rather than coming across as an expert or as a teacher, somebody who trains, but who doesn't facilitate transformation. And we don't want to do that if we're trying to use our speaking as a way to connect with our ideal individual or organizational coaching clients. And the other piece of this is in our storytelling. So we actually wound up talking about this a little bit earlier. It was pointed out. When we tell stories, if we truly want them to feel like they are creating transformation for our audiences, we want to begin with what's that desired aha moment. So I'm going to use the story that you heard me share earlier as an example of this. When I decided to tell that headgear current event story, I didn't say, hmm, it would be fun to tell a story about headgear. I started with what's that desired aha which in my case was, I want people to recognize that the story they're carrying around about who they are as a communicator, as a speaker, as a thought leader, is playing a profound role in whether or not they're going after visibility opportunities. That's the desired aha moment. Then I took a step backward and said, what's a question or series of questions I could ask? So aha moment, that story we're carrying around is important. Then I reverse engineered. The questions are, What's the story you're carrying around? How might that be getting you in your own way of living into the legacy that you want to leave? Then I identified what's a story that I can tell that allows me to do that. So to be clear, in your presentation itself, you're going to tell the story and you're going to ask the questions. But to figure it out, you're going to reverse engineer. Desired aha moment that allows you into the problem. Take a step back. What's the question or series of questions you're going to ask to get to that aha? And then what's a story? It might be your story. It could be a client story, somebody's story that sets you up to be able to do that. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, if you know that your ideas can positively perhaps radically improve people's trajectories, it's not only an opportunity, but really a responsibility to figure out how to get visible. And it's not enough to have one signature speech that's awesome. <laughs> the next piece is we have to make sure we're consistently getting booked to deliver it, whether that's online, in person, or for a lot of coaches, a combination of the two when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. So here are my thoughts on where the best opportunities for coaches uh, are right now. Absolutely virtual speaking gigs. So for a lot of you, you know that your ideal clients, whether they're individuals or organizations are in professional associations. Maybe you work with lawyers and so you wanna be speaking to lawyer associations. Maybe you know that you wanna to speak to entrepreneurs. So for you, it's chambers or business groups like eWomen or NABO. For others of you, it might be CEOs who, you're, who are your ideal decision maker. And so you wanna be speaking at those CEO forums. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, and I've seen this in the last 10 days as we've started to finally get some good news about vaccines, irrespective of how you feel about a vaccine, more organizations, some of the bigger conferences are starting to feel more comfortable announcing that they're moving events back to in-person around the fall based on those vaccine projections. And many of them start to look for speakers six to 12 months in advance. So even if you're somebody who, for whatever reason, is reticent to embrace the online, it's still a great opportunity to be pitching for in-person speaking engagements. One of the things that's beautiful about having a signature speech that takes you through a problem, cause, solution, and calls to action is it also lends itself really nicely to podcast interviews. In a good podcast interview, you're coming up with questions for that podcast host that essentially allows you to move through the content of your signature speech so that prospects are getting that exact same experience. At the end, they're getting an invitation to that exact same free goodie conversation, whatever it is. And TV segments. 
So once you have that signature speech, guess what? You also know how you could be pitching yourself for television media. And right now, TV is also more accessible than it's ever been. So it used to be most coaches would do local media. I had clients who did national media that they had to travel for. But right now, nobody has to travel for TV segments. So you don't only have national opportunities you don't have to leave home for. You also have all the other regional networks that are now not only looking for local experts. And so a lot of the things that I'm seeing coaches do really well who have that signature speech is also be able to use it across media, podcasts, TV segments, and so forth. And so I made a lot of mistakes, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of my speaking content. <laughs> I also made a lot when it came to pitching. So one of, that, one of the biggest mistakes was I would search for official opportunities. I would go online to search engines and I would say, um, coach association call for speakers. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's Technique brought me to you tonight when I knew that I was going to be, um, well, I was supposed to be in Los Angeles speaking to a CEO group. But oftentimes our best opportunities are not going to come from anonymous submissions. So when I say that I pitched and prayed, this was not overly religious, but I would submit blindly to people that I didn't know and cross my fingers and my toes and hope that they would pick me rather than utilizing warm contacts. So my hunch is that every single one of you right now who's been working with coaching clients knows my ideal client might be in this kind of group or that kind of group. And because you've been doing the work for a while, you probably have a sense of some of the people who might run those professional associations or who might run those business mastermind groups. But yet it might feel a lot safer to go online, search for opportunities and blindly submit. I love it when in my programs, we usually start by getting comfortable with visibility. We do that work. We then come up with the big idea. Then we create the signature speech. Then we go to pitching. How many people wind up having lots of presentations booked before we ever get to pitching because they start reaching out to those warm contacts and having natural conversations rather than having to pitch. I also didn't get on the phone enough. So much like if we want to be able to enroll people to work with us, oftentimes the phone is involved. Oftentimes I would pitch and it would just be email rather than inviting people to a call where we could have a short conversation to see if it was a good fit on both sides. And I wasn't clear on my desired business outcome. And so I spoke for a lot of the wrong groups rather than really consistently asking myself as that filter question, is the kind of person that I work with as a coach likely to be in this group? Can I do some research to make sure that if I have an assumption they are, they actually are? And if they're not, unless this is purely a keynote and revenue generating, this is not the best place for me to show up because it just doesn't make sense. So let's look at what actually goes into a successful email pitch. When we are reaching out, we want to make sure that we're speaking to decision makers' needs for their audience. Rather than starting with, I'm the greatest thing ever, <laughs> instead, uh, we want to talk about where they're coming from, speak to that conversation. So as the head of the XYZ group, your members are really hungry for strategies to be able to more effectively manage their teams. And now they're struggling more than they ever have because they're having to manage remotely without the benefit of being in the same place. Again, that doesn't have anything to do with me yet. It just demonstrates I understand that group. Then I could move into my secret sauce. So I know this audience well. For the last two decades, as a team systems coach, I've been supporting people in this industry and that industry to be able to do X, Y, Z. So we can talk about our mastery, but first we have to start with who the people in that audience are and demonstrating we understand them. Then we can move into our presentation description and key takeaways in our bio. And I'm going to share with you some sample narrative in a moment for what a good presentation description looks and sounds like. Then we want a call to action. And here in a pitch, normally we want to recommend, if you're interested, I'd love to ask you some more questions about your group. Here's a way to schedule 15 minutes so that we can see if this is a good fit on both sides. Most of us who have positioned ourselves for visibility opportunities know enough to be dangerous in this area. 
However, where we might get stuck is actually in describing our signature presentation in a way that feels specific to our idea worth spreading. So I've given you some examples from me before, but I wanna give you something that is not one of my presentations so that you can hear it and read it. So let's imagine that I was a financial coach. I could say in my signature presentation, retire rich and relaxed. I show primary breadwinner women how to create a retirement plan that integrates important financial considerations with their desired lifestyle goals. So if I'm an event organizer, I understand exactly that this person knows my audience provided it's primary breadwinner women. And I understand in one sentence exactly what this presentation is going to be about, how to create a retirement plan that integrates both the financials with lifestyle. Then it sets me up to be able to go into specific bullet points that show by the end of the presentation, these are the exact takeaways, because we want to show we're not just walking a good talk, um, but that we're able to truly deliver. We want our bullet points in our pitches to have strong verbs, and we want all of our bullet points to be relevant. So one of my favorite strategies when I'm working with folks in terms of their marketing language for their speaking and other visibility is to ask them, so what? <laughs> with each bullet point, so what? Why does that matter? And if they're able to tell me, it sh they shouldn't have to tell me rather, it should already be in their bullet points. So in this hypothetical presentation, by the end, you'll be able to create a concrete vision for retirement that includes time and money for self-care and travel. If I'm reading this, it's like, yeah, I know why, because I want money. <laughs> I want to take care of myself and I want to be able to travel. Design a retirement plan, though, a plan that allows me to save 10% of my annual salary while enjoying a minimum of two vacations per year. I know as an event organizer, this is very specific and something that's going to appeal to my audience. Eliminate the five spending sucks that undermine long-term wealth. So as you're describing your signature presentation, you want to imagine that if this event organizer was going to lift this language and put it on their website, would it get people to show up for the presentation? And if your answer is no, it's a sign you've got to keep working on those bullet points because they're not quite there yet. So before we talk about any specific questions you have about anything that we've covered tonight, I want you to take a moment and think about what do your prospective clients really most need to hear from you as a speaker and thought leader to make that decision if you are someone that they want to continue to stay connected with and potentially work with. Now notice, I prioritized stay connected with and potentially work with. It's connection over conversion first and foremost. But I want you to note that for yourself if you haven't already. What is the most important thing they need to hear from you? So that again, whether you're still at the stage of coming up with the idea worth spreading, you're thinking about actually developing that signature speech that you can give again and again, you need support with coming up with what's your offer at the end, or you're at the stage of figuring out where you should be speaking to make sure it's the right audience, you know what to come back to. And then also get clear, what are the gaps that you have a responsibility to address? Maybe for you, it's the comfort with visibility. Maybe it's your speaking presence that you feel a little awkward on camera or in person. Maybe you don't have the signature presentation. Maybe you don't really understand yet um, how to be able to book the right in-person and virtual speaking engagements. And if any of this sounds like this is what you're being called to do, I invite you, you can grab a copy of my book, which definitely continues this conversation in terms of visibility. And it was really written for coaches who are wanting to amplify their voices so that they can show their clients how to do the same. And I do have a program called the Spotlight Speaker Accelerator, which helps you do exactly those things, transform stage fright into unshakable presence, create that speaking content. And it works with people over the course of 90 days, week after week, to understand how to create all the marketing pieces to make visibility a consistent source of leads for your business. And if you're curious, you can learn more at spotlightspeakeraccelerator.com. 
Before I come back, uh, I want to say something that might sound a little jarring, but I've had, unfortunately, enough people in my life to know that this is true, that when we start doing this visibility work, getting on live and virtual stages, writing pitches, having persuasive conversations with event organizer, there's a lot of similarities with drug use. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that at first we are positive that we are going to die. After we do it though, for a little while, we realize actually it can be a rush. And if we keep doing it, ultimately we get hooked. And um, I would love to be your partner and get you hooked on speaking as a coach in a way that lets you bring 100% of your authentic self, if that feels like something you're interested in. And these are all the different ways that we can stay in touch. As I mentioned, I love LinkedIn. Um, I've got that LinkedIn learning course. And so I'm on that platform probably the most at Alexia Vernon. I've got a podcast for coaches called Moxylicious that's all about thought leadership. I shared with you earlier the book your first speaking gig that's all about the pitching piece. I've got the coaching program, the Spotlight Speaker Accelerator, and that's my email. And so when I said, oftentimes things will percolate for people a day or two later, as you come back to the notes you've hopefully taken, please feel free to check in and share with me what, um, what you're coming up with. And if there's maybe one or two questions I could most answer to get you on your way. But for those of you who already know, I've got some questions right now, and I want to take this opportunity to ask, please feel free to do so. And I'll also look in the chat if you prefer to ask that way, but if you prefer to come off um, or come on to video and audio, I'd love to talk to you because oftentimes since we're coaches in a conversation, we, could get, we can get to something so much more quickly than if we're typing back and forth. What questions do you guys have for Alexia? You are welcome, thank you. So one of the things that we love to do as we get to the end of our presentations is do what Gideon just did. And that is share what the most valuable thing is that we got out of the presentation. And so if none of you have any direct questions for Alexia, then let's all share um, what we got out of the presentation that was of value. And Alexia, I'll start while others are thinking. Um, I just wanna thank you so much for coming and speaking to our group and being a part of it. I know that I had built my coaching practice through speaking, but then at some point, and this was before COVID hit, Orange County seemed to become so saturated with speakers that I sort of gave up because it was just so hard to get speaking engagements. And your presentation has completely inspired me to start thinking about it again. So thank you so much for that. And You're who welcome. else has something? Can I say like? something right back to you? Yes, that you I want other people to hear as well, that for any of you who've had that similar experience, right now, use this opportunity where let's say you know your ideal client is, and I'm coming back to a lawyer just because it's at the top of mind right now, you have that easy opportunity to be able to reach out to all the associations of American Bar or female attorneys or Black female attorneys. There's so many different groups, not only in your local community, but right now you have access to all the regional chapters. And that is, I hate to say a gift at this moment because 2020 has been a lot um, for most of us, but that is one of the gifts, if I dare call it that, of this year is that opportunity to access so many more gigs than when we have to go face to face. Thank you for that. It's very inspiring. So who else would like to share? I saw, I saw a couple in the chat. Who else would like to share out loud what you got out of this presentation for Alexia? I love seeing that it's not fear, it's sensation. Those are words I strive to live by, not only for speaking, but for all difficult situations. We can say difficult things. We can uh, also feel difficult things and get through it, including around our own visibility. Excellent. Doug, I see your... I, I have a question, Alexia. I'm a slow thinker. I know you asked for it five minutes ago, but... No, you're all good. <laughs> um, 
I love doing public speaking. I get a real rush out of it. Since we've been locked down, I can't get comfortable with Zoom. I don't know how to relate to the audience. Everybody sits there and looks at you. You don't know if they're awake or asleep. People are slow to ask questions. What are your suggestions to liven up the virtual presentation? So a few things. Pardon me, that's the chili I ate for dinner coming back to bite me now. Uh, <laughs> Note to self, do not eat five minutes before a presentation in the future, I digress. So a couple things. One, for me, I love being on Zoom meeting versus Zoom webinar when an event organizer will let me do it for a couple of reasons. So I've been looking at all of you on gallery view, which to me makes me feel so much better because not everyone will be on video, not everyone will be smiling and taking notes, but I'm disciplined to know who are my people who are telegraphing engagement. And I look at them consistently, even though they can't tell that for my sense of connection. So that's one that if you're just looking and feeling like there's no one there, it's harder. I sometimes have to present where there's hundreds of people. And so people are not all um, able to be on Zoom meeting. And then I will literally, and this will sound crazy, but I will put things up in my office to help me remember their spaces. So I might just put up, sometimes they're my daughter's stuffed animals because I've got shelves over here. But if you didn't have that, even pictures to remind me there's humans I'm connecting with. Now, in terms of what to do during the presentation, making sure that you start with a story that's likely going to make people smile and laugh a little bit becomes even more important. So sometimes in my keynote, I might tell a soul stirring story. Um, but on virtual, I strive to integrate more humor than ever before, particularly at the beginning, because usually once people laugh, then I feel like they're in the pocket and I've got them. Second, I like to build in some kind of hot seating share back moment that's relatively easy. So I know that even in the best of circumstances, if I was in a, a live room and let's say 10 people out of 30 would raise their hands, I only have time for two anyway, usually one or two people, as long as the group is about 25 or above, will always volunteer. And then again, through that hot seat, even if other people are not able to participate, usually that starts to get more people talking back to me in the chat, like what happened this evening. Thank you. That's helpful. The last thing I would say is for any of you who realize the barrier to me going and pitching for virtual presentations is getting comfortable on Zoom. Think about who are other coaches who have groups that don't do the exact same thing. So let's say you are a copywriting coach and you've got a colleague who's a business coach. Go to their community that might have seven to 10 people and even have them just interview you. Do a Q&A in front of that audience so that you have some groups that are going to be more inclined to be really warm where some, you're stepping into someone else's community who already respects you, who's going to set you up and make you look like the thought leader that you are, because that will help you just develop evidence for yourself that it's not quite so scary. Okay, good, thank you. You're welcome. Other shares for Alexia, gems that you're taking away today that you'd like to share to her with her personally? Okay. Laura? Yeah, I, I'm I'm enrolled in a in a speaking course now, and I, I I do a lot of speaking. I do a lot of teaching, but but I've my issue has been the sales piece, of course, the um, the pitch. So I'm learning to do that. I found that that your way is extraordinarily complementary to that. But what I got from you, and it's so important, is the importance of sharing me as a coach little tiny ways for me to exhibit who I am in most of my professional life. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And I'm glad that was helpful. That I, I think is the piece for a lot of us as coaches. We've been taught by people how to sell courses or how to fill lists, but not to really demonstrate who we are as a coach. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. I, I have something to say. I I've always been someone, um, I would declare that I don't do training. I facilitate learning in an experiential way, but I've always felt so alone. And today, after hearing you 
about, you know, if you want people to see you as a coach, you, you, you always show up as a coach. And I feel very validated that, that what I believed in and how I kind of decided to, to do engaged group facility learning programs, not training, is really making me feel more authentic. And I feel that I just feel validated. I'm not alone. And this is actually an authentic way. Uh, it's good. Thank you. I love that you shared that, Yen. I feel the same way. I like facilitating way better. Any other thoughts or gems you'd like to share? Okay, I'd like to pass it back to you, Greta. But before yeah. I pass it back to you, I just want to thank you again, Alexia. I know I've already thanked you a couple times, but it has just been amazing. Thank you all. Yeah. Great, great, Alexia. I mean, I'm thinking of when we all joined our little breakout groups almost two hours ago and how far we've all come. So thanks for that. Also, special thanks to you, uh, Nahid, our programming director on our board for, for arranging for this great talk and Sharon, Carol, for your support on the committee. Also want to shout out to Doug Gefeller. Say hi, Doug. He is, uh, he's on our board also. And, and Peter Russell, who's off camera, she's also on a board. Special thanks to everyone who called in tonight from locally, from inside the state, and from all the way across to my home state of Ohio. Thank you. <laughs> you are all welcome all the time. We've got a fabulous, fabulous program for you coming up in the new year. Don't forget our holiday party. You are all welcome to join, even though you may not be members of the chapter. We welcome everyone at every event. So do come, and in the meantime, stay safe. We look forward to seeing you another evening. Take Thank care. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Night. Thank you. Good night, Brenda. Bye, Brenda. Good to see, Good to see ya. Bye, Betsy. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Uh, take care. Great. It's always great being here with you guys. So happy to see you. So great happy having you. you. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. That's Thank right. I should have said that, too. Yeah. Thanks. Take care. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night. Thank you. That was good, huh? You rock. All right, let's turn okay. off the record. I should have turned off the recording earlier, but <laughs> we'll have to um, edit. <laughs> yeah, okay. See ya.